on the razor's edge of both science and survival. No lush tropical rainforest for these chimps. But the harsher landscape, where the forest gives way to patchy woodlands and sizzling savanna. It's a landscape much like the one where our earliest ancestors may have taken their first steps, literally, toward being human. And these chimps are doing remarkable things. Enjoying an afternoon dip, taking refuge in caves, and now hunting mammals with spears. What can they tell us about our origins and about ourselves? After the dramatic rescue of a kidnapped infant, anthropologist Jill Preetz and her groundbreaking chimps are rewriting the book on what it means to be an ape and what it means to be human. It's approaching noon in the patchy woodlands of Senegal, West Africa. The temperatures are reaching 45 degrees Celsius in the shade. This is a place no primate in its right mind, chimp or human, would choose to live. But these guys don't have a choice. And perhaps neither did our ancestors. So anthropologist Jill Preetz has been up since before dawn, patiently following some of the most intriguing primates in the world, as she has been doing for nine years now. These chimps can barely turn around without creating a stir. Well, the whole reason that I chose Fangoli as a study site is because it is so different from any other site where chimps have been habituated. You get tiny little patches of forest, so it's really woodland and grassland. And so I knew that there would be significant differences in chimp behavior, but I would never have predicted some of the differences that we see. Some of the things Jill has seen here have been shaking up both the study of chimps and the study of our earliest human ancestors, or hominids. It all starts some five to seven million years ago, when the world was cooling, drying, forcing the vast rainforests of Central Africa into retreat. In places, the shadowy creature that gave rise to both chimps and humans, our last common ancestor, faced a choice, retreat with the thick rainforests, or master a harsher life, where the forest thinned out, a place like this. Over the eons, they went their separate ways, one eventually on its knuckles, the other, for reasons that are a matter of raging controversy, standing up. And the chimps here do things chimps just aren't expected to do, like taking refuge in caves. Only rarely have chimps been seen in caves, but here in Fongoli, it's a regular thing. It's about six degrees Celsius cooler than even in the shade of the woods. On the edge of survival here in Fongoli, six degrees makes all the difference. You can tell a lot from sitting at the mouth of a cave about what's going on in the Fongoli chimp community at that time. You can predict that, for example, when the dominant male, Yopokan, comes, he's going to display until he gets himself a place in the cave. And you'll see huge fights where Lupin, who's an up-and-coming male, will do displays and actually throw something into the cave. And a number of males will come out. Thank <laughs> you. 
The scene may call to mind B-movie imaginings of how our ape-man ancestors lived through the ages. But there may be a serious lesson to be learned about ourselves here. It shows how significant the environment can be in terms of ape behavior and this type of environment. And also I think it's, it's interesting to people because it's sort of reminiscent of perhaps early humans. You think of, you know, cave use and perhaps the first shelters were caves. With the commotion over, a mother and her daughter prepare for a siesta in the cave. That they are both alive and together is pretty much a miracle. Amy, about a year old now, plays with sticks while mom, Tia, rests. But this peaceful mother-daughter scene seemed all but impossible after the terrifying events of months ago. It all started at the beginning of 2009 with Jill's worst nightmare. Her project manager had spotted a baby chimp in the local town, perhaps destined for the pet trade. By the time a panicked Jill raced back to Fongoli from the U.S., her team had managed to convince the locals to give the baby back. Jill and the team were determined to reintroduce the baby to the wild. But that would only be possible if the mother was alive, and usually mothers are killed when babies are taken. Jill had to find the chimps, and fast. I was walking actually not far from here, and I didn't hear the chimps, but all of a sudden I saw a Carmoco walking across the road, and it was the greatest thing I could imagine. And so I radioed Johnny, I said, the chimps are here. And right after that, I saw that Tia was there with no baby. It was only then that she knew the baby was Amy, and that there was real hope. They quickly retrieved the infant and headed back to the chimps. They placed the baby in a bag and carried her as close as they thought they could safely get to a fig tree where the chimps were feeding. Finally, a remarkable young orphan named Mike noticed them. Mike is very curious and he likes to watch people, I think, more than some of the other chimps. And so he saw us, and he was watching us, and so we backed away, and the baby just sat in the bag. And then pretty soon, Mike comes up the hill, and he kind of stands up like, like um, chimps will do when they want the infant to come to them. And the baby sort of, it looked like the baby kind of leapt into his arms, and he grabbed her at the same time, and they came together. The baby gave out this little scream, I think, of excitement, really. <laughs> And Mike immediately went to the fig tree, and Tia at that point had just reached the ground. And Mike handed Amy to Tia, and she just embraced Amy. And then all the chimps came to see Amy. And so I was really unable to see, but what I could hear amidst all those chimps was little pant grunt greetings from Amy to all these chimps. Thanks to Mike, the mother and daughter reunion went off more smoothly than Jill could have imagined. Little Amy, aside from being unwilling to let her mom out of arm's reach, seemed fine. But that was just the beginning of the miracle. Tia, who had been injured in the incident, swatted miserably at her wounds and kept putting the baby down. And then, Mike came to the rescue once again. He started carrying the baby for Tia. And he did so for two days, until Tia regained her strength. He was apparently acting altruistically, which is supposed to be a human trait. As far as we know, Mike's not related to Tia. I mean, that's just not something an, an unrelated adolescent male does. I think that on a number of levels, this incident with Mike 
and Tia and Amy is yet another reason that we should really reassess the, the way we define ourselves and, and how we separate ourselves from other animals. But this is only the beginning of how the Fungoli chimps have been redefining their species and ours. The rains are late this year, adding to the misery of chimps and humans alike. Despite the heat though, they're still chimps, especially the infants and juveniles. So there has to be time for mischief. And time for the adult males to show their stuff. But it's Jill's female chimps who have really been stirring things up in the scientific community by knocking humans down yet another peg. They're hunting with spears. This is their prey. Bush babies are little primates that hunt by night, but retreat into the hollows of trees by day. And this is Tumbo, the rock star of spear hunting and the bush baby's nemesis. In 2007, Tumbo was caught on tape just after she had been stabbing a pointed stick into a hole in a tree. Then she sat down to enjoy a luscious meal of bush baby that she had killed with a weapon of her own making. It was a stunning moment. This is an amazingly significant event. The fact that chimps at Fongoli hunt with tools is just unique. I mean, we had never expected to see that with chimpanzees. In fact, that's something we've used to define our own species. Reaction to the news that chimps were hunting with tools generated tremendous excitement and some skepticism. The spear hunting in Fongoli is fascinating. And when I first heard it, I was intrigued. I mean, that is incredible to take tool use and have it be combined with hunting. Those are two very important aspects of human evolution. And before this discovery, uh, this activity of using a tool to kill prey was seen as a uniquely human behavior and even one of the defining traits of humans. Others were not exactly sure how to interpret the behavior, though, and not convinced it is hunting. The probing is uh, what happens when you see a hole and you put something into the hole to see what comes out. And uh, chimpanzees do that everywhere. Uh, hunting, I think of, as they see a prey animal and then they go after it. For her part, Jill's observations lead her to believe this is clearly hunting, not strenuous probing. That's not what the, the chimps at Fongoli are doing. Most of the time what they're doing is really trying to incapacitate the prey. And so what you see is such a forceful jabbing motion um, that in fact I've, I've described it as uh, reminiscent of the shower scene in Psycho. Could this be how our earliest ancestors hunted? With wooden spears? Because wood rarely fossilizes, the chances of finding such relics are vanishingly small. And the idea that tool use could possibly go that far back is highly contentious. But Jill's chimps may give us a glimpse into that ancient past, some five to seven million years ago. Proving beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jill's females are hunting is frustrating, though. Jill follows the males here, not wanting to habituate the females to human presence for reasons frighteningly demonstrated by Amy's kidnapping. So she hasn't been able to capture a whole hunt on video yet. Of course, the chimps of Fongoli are blissfully unaware of the radical nature of their everyday lives. Their empathy. Their cave use. Their spear hunting are only the beginning of their extraordinary story. the morning in darkness, up before the chimps, and anxious not to be left behind as they awaken.
Every day, Jill and her team each pick a different male chimp to follow, not wanting to habituate more vulnerable females with infants. And since it's mainly the females that hunt, it's all the more remarkable that she and her team have now witnessed spear hunting 90 odd times. In a very exciting new twist, they've seen adolescents, even young males, starting to try their hand at it. Today, Jill is following Mike, the chimp hero in Tia and Amy's near tragedy. And she arrives just a hair too late to catch him in the act of spear hunting. But he's left behind a smoking gun. The spear itself, stuck in the hold of a tree. What has happened is that Mike has left his tool inconveniently stuck into the tree. And this happens, I think, like in one in ten cases, it seems. And so Johnny's about to go up and retrieve it for me, because he's a master climber. Johnny Dondo Conte, Jill's project manager, is not only a master climber, he's a chimp observer of the first order. Eddie and So this is a tool that Mike made. And it's um it's a little shorter than average, so it would be about like this long. But it's quite sturdy. And uh so this is what he was using to stab down into the cavity. Early this year, Jill caught the youngster Fanta, a four-year-old female, awkwardly trying her hand at spear hunting, giving us just a glimpse of what the adult females are doing. But so far, the youngsters don't really seem to have the hang of it. So what they do is they almost always break off a live branch. Jill demonstrates the advanced hunting techniques of her Amazons of the woodlands. And this effectively makes the tool sturdier. And then a final step for some chimpanzees, especially some young females like Tumbo, is that they actually sharpen the end of the, the tool with their teeth. What the chimpanzee does then is that they, they take the tool and jab it repeatedly into the hollow. And if they're lucky, they get a bush baby. Sometimes, Jill stumbles upon what looks to be the scene of a crime. Today, it's a spear tipped with the fur of a potential victim. I want to scalp baby here on the end of it. Yeah, just little tufts. And you can see that they modified the end of it as well. And further down the trail, more gruesome evidence of a killing. A bush baby jaw. Meat is a rare treat here, especially for the females. Males capture prey by hand and don't usually share the meat. So a vital source of protein is also that icon of chimp studies, the termite mound. Almost every day, the Fungoli chimps reenact the moment that would forever change how we humans see ourselves. This is the same scene Jane Goodall witnessed in 1960. A chimp poking a slender stem into a termite mound to fish for insects. This is tool making, however crude. And up until then, only humans were supposed to make tools. Goodall's mentor, the famed paleontologist Louis Leakey, was moved to say, now we must redefine man, redefine tool, or accept chimpanzees as humans. Chimps will catch literally hundreds of termites a day. Jill is lucky to get one. It's definitely not as easy as it looks. 
I have yet to get a termite. Termites are three times as calorie rich as chicken, but they don't taste like chicken, and they bite. <gasps> Got one. How did I taste? Oh, I don't mind you. I just tasted like dirt, like bad dirt. Wow, that was not good. Mm. That was really nasty. Baby Amy, fully recovered from her kidnapping, is only vaguely interested in the termite mound. But her older cousin, two-year-old Teva, intently studies the adults' every move. Although termite fishing is common among chimps, every group has its own tools and techniques. These are a part of their traditions, their cultures. Chimp culture? The term seems like an oxymoron. We like to think of culture as the pinnacles of human achievement, of art, history, and science. But in anthropological terms, culture is the transmission of group knowledge from one generation to another. Little Teva is doing her best to master one of the great arts of her culture, whether she knows it or not. It usually takes four or five years to master the technique, but today she has an early triumph. The idea of chimp culture, once radical, is now increasingly accepted among primatologists. Chimps around Africa use different techniques to smash nuts and fruits. Some use wooden hammers and anvils, some stones. And the Fungoli chimps slam baobab fruits against stones or trees. Ant dipping, like termite fishing, happens almost everywhere. Chimps in some communities even eat distasteful medicinal plants when they're sick, passing on the knowledge that bitter medicine can make you better. As in human cultures, many chimp traditions are social. There's A-frame grooming, where two chimps will clasp hands high above their heads while inspecting each other for tasty parasites. One of the most interesting and subtle things most chimps engage in is something called leaf clipping, biting off bits of leaves with a distinct popping sound to get each other's attention. But it means different things in different places. In some places, it's a come on to the ladies. Here in Fangoli, it's a back off to other males. Or a part of an exciting development in their lives like a nice fruit tree. Right now they're sort of advertising themselves but also just excited because they're starting to eat again. I mean, chimps get excited about everything. Here in Fongoli, leaf clipping among males leads inevitably to extravagant tantrums. <laughs> Traditions passed down from adult to child. It's a flow of knowledge that once only we seemed capable of. Until recently though, no one had any idea just how many generations these startling cultural practices could go back among the chimps, especially tool use. For a long time, researchers assumed that chimps had learned how to use tools by watching humans. Then, in another part of Africa, researchers decided to do something radical 
conduct chimp archaeology. And that changed everything. In the Thai forest in the Ivory Coast, primatologists have been watching chimps use granite hammer stones to break open nuts on stone anvils for decades. Recently, primatologist Christoph Bosch and archaeologist Julio Mercator decided to start digging to see if they could find older nut-cracking tools. The first time archaeology had been applied to chimps. And they found what they were looking for in 4,300-year-old sediments. That's more than 200 generations of a chimp stone age, meaning that chimpanzees couldn't have copied tool-making from humans there were no human settlements in the Thai forest that long ago. But some take this as evidence of a far more earth-shattering possibility. That stone tool use goes back at least as far as that critical moment when human and chip ancestors parted ways. They use tools, stone tools, and in our human history, we've also used stone tools. So it's a shared behavior, and if that's so, it might go right back to the beginnings and even back to the common ancestor. Here's the catch. Clearly human-made stone tools like these don't appear in the record until two and a half million years ago. The common ancestor may have lived five to seven million years ago. Where are the tools that fill that four million year gap? Harris thinks they're out there, but they've just never been recognized. They look too much like natural stones. So he's got his graduate students copying chimp tool use in the lab, hoping to create an instantly recognizable signature dividing tool from natural stone. And you can see very clearly that it leaves a, a pit or an indentation in that rock and that's very different than the other parts of the surface of this uh, rock in front of me. Once they've created this template of iconic tool use markings, they'll start searching in fossil beds where our earliest ancestors have been found hoping to find the stones that will rewrite our earliest prehistory. This is such novel work. It's, it, it's, we're right at the, I, I was going to say the cutting edge, I should say, perhaps say the pounding edge of, of uh, studies in this field. I'm convinced we're going to find these, these pounding tools. The notion that tool use goes back that far is catching on among scientists. One day, probably, we'll be able to find sites like the ones that Mercada analyzed in West Africa, and that will be proof that the Australopithecines did use stone tools. Absolutely. Tool use goes back to the last common ancestor, I would say. Anthropologists Cricket Sands and David Morgan have spent a decade studying chimps in the remote Guologo Triangle in the Republic of Congo. Hoping to capture the tool use behavior of these chimps, they set up camera traps around termite mounds. The images they captured simply blew their minds. No matter how much camouflage the scientists put around the camera traps, the chimps noticed them right away, even using tools to probe them. But what was even more remarkable was the discovery that the Guologo chimps were not just using tools, they were using an entire tool kit, further narrowing the human-ape divide. Having selected both thick sticks and thin ones, they carry them with them to the termite mound, then use them in sequence. Then they'll grab the stout stick and hold it in both hands, and they'll actually use a foot sometimes as leverage. And after they've created a tunnel into the nest, they'll pull out the stick and they'll smell it to see if they've killed any termites underneath the ground. And if they're successful, they'll take their herb stem and they thread that into the tunnel and they extract termites. 
Chimps in Central Africa have a real sweet tooth, and their honey-gathering toolkits can be even more sophisticated. In fact, a researcher recently discovered no fewer than five tools used at a honey-gathering site. So, a big tool to pound open the hive. And then they open the hive, and they can't quite reach in with their hands, they would fashion a dipping probe to then follow in, or a lever open tool to pry open the nest a bit further. But you see all these tools being used one after another. It's really very exciting. When a chimpanzee creates different tools, carries them to the site of termites or honey, and uses them in sequence for different purposes, they're showing incredibly sophisticated planning and deliberation. This too was once thought to be beyond the mental capacity of any animals but humans. Well, what the toolkit does is to show us that the chimpanzee mind is not just responding straight away to an immediate problem, but it is uh, being more creative. So here we have evidence of a relatively advanced cognitive ability. For Jill, Cricket's and Dave's footage was a revelation, and now she'll be on the lookout for toolkits among her singular chimpanzees. But she still doesn't have the critical video of her chimp's most extraordinary tool making and tool use, a complete hunt, from the manufacture of a tool through the killing of the prey. Fortunately, the horizon is darkening, ushering in the season of the rains. It is in the next few weeks that she'll have the best chance of capturing her chimp Amazons on the hunt. Weeks later than usual, the skies finally crack open and lash the woodland savanna of Fungoli with wind and rain. Water instantly changes the landscape, eliciting dormant green from the grasses and trees. It moves like an alien force through dry gullies, and a very special place begins to fill with water. Jill has a good idea where the chimps might be headed today. After six months of blistering heat, everyone will be dying for a dip in the pool. This is the Sokoto waterhole, and a place where the Fungoli chimps again insist on breaking with chimpanzee convention. First to arrive is a young male. He's grabbing his chance to have the water to himself. Because once the big males arrive, he'll be kicked out to the kiddie pool. Everyone has his own approach to getting wet. There's the time-honored practice of dipping a toe in, of course. Chimps for a very long time we thought to be almost hydrophobic, afraid of water. And since we've been studying chimps for decades, we know that some chimps are not so afraid of water, but they don't like it. At Fungoli, they love water. Frito, an especially mischievous adolescent and a favorite of the researchers, simply adores it. Frito especially seems to be intent on uh, getting into the water and the adult males are not going to let him while they're there. You can sit at a pool literally for hours and there'll be someone in and out, in and out. And that just really isn't something you think, think about when you, when you think of chimps, you know, this love of water. As we watch Jill's chimps enjoying their afternoon dip in such human-like ways, we're left to ask, 
So what exactly is the distinction between chimp and human? Over the years, man the toolmaker, man the hunter, man the culture bearer, all of these have been overturned. Man the thinker is another one. But our big brains came millions of years after we split from the other apes. Fossil-wise, other than some differences in hominid teeth, there's only one distinction left. Humanity stood up. The early hominids, or Australopithecines, would probably have looked very much at home in a place like Fongoli. Well, I mean, to, to a large extent, what the Australopithecines looked like was a chimpanzee standing upright. Their heads were a little bit different, their face was shorter, there were slight changes in limb proportions, but they were about the size of a chimpanzee, and uh, if you saw a chimpanzee standing upright from a long way away, you could easily confuse it for an Australopithecine. But why stand up? The question that has plagued the study of human evolution for decades has exploded into multiple answers. There are a lot of theories. There are probably uh, as many theories as there are paleontologists to make theories. And that's one of the reasons the, the study of the Fongoli is important. It's that kind of setting that, in which our early human ancestors might have first walked on two legs and taken the initial steps towards being human. One of the first theories of bipedalism that we stood up to see over the tall grasses of Serengeti-like plains in search of big game to hunt has fallen by the wayside. Discoveries of very early hominids indicate that they were definitely not capable of bringing down large animals. And they lived in woodlands like Fungoli, not vast open savanna. Still, gathering food in a woodland means lots of traveling. Human walking is surprisingly efficient at slow speeds, certainly more so than the four-legged gates of chimps or our last common ancestor. Standing up might simply have been about saving energy. Because so much bipedalism happens during male displays, some have proposed that it originated with social functions to intimidate other males and even show off male assets to females. Or to free the hands to bring home food to females encumbered by infants. In Fungoli, Jill sees an awful lot of standing simply to reach up for food both on the ground and in the low branches of trees. This is a way of feeding in a woodland savanna that wouldn't be much help in a rainforest, where the fruit is 25 meters in the air and you simply must climb to get it. Some think this low-hanging fruit idea presents a compelling precursor to full bipedalism. The idea is that, that the advantage of being bipedal, if you're a quadruped, is that you can reach food items that you couldn't reach if you remained quadrupedal. So in short trees, where the fruit is near the ground, you can reach up and harvest this fruit with both your hands. There's a problem, though. For millions of years, our first ancestors still had hands and shoulders suited to climbing trees. In this hypothesis, the males probably would have monopolized the easy feeding from the ground, forcing females and juveniles into the low branches of the trees to get their own fruit, thus preserving the climbing anatomy of our early ancestors. And standing up in the trees themselves, which chimps do all of the time, might have started selecting for upright anatomy as well. The matter is far from settled, however. And the romp at the Fungoli waterhole reminds us of another possibility. 
For some other scientists, it was water that got us up on our feet. As the climate dried and the rainforest retreated, water would have been at a premium. The idea here is that uh, these, these chimp-like ancestors would have the, the very rare luck of finding themselves in an area that remained wet even when the climate in general was drying and the forests were therefore retreating. Venturing into the water, they may have stumbled upon an incredibly nutritious source of food. The roots of water-based plants, for example. Waiting in search of them and simply needing to get to the other side may have primed the pump for becoming an upright ape. So I think it's both walking across water and getting food from inside the water that are stimulating our imagination here, but particularly it's getting the food in the water where you'd stand there for some time and, uh, and yank at these, uh, these, these lovely foods that come up from the mud. Walking on the ground, walking in trees, walking through water. Perhaps no one will ever settle the vexing question of bipedalism once and for all. But since it's the defining characteristic of our species, we'll keep trying. Jill, for her part, doesn't see any attempts at wading or searching for water-based foods here. There's just a cool respite, a chance for fun. But not all is fun and games. There's still the deadly serious business of hunting. And finally, one wet day, Jill and one of her students witness this remarkable scene. It's Bilbo, not an adult female, not an adolescent, but a 25-year-old male, unmistakably hunting. Again and again, he stabs at the hole with a stripped, sharpened stick, the violence of it reverberating through the forest. Then, he breaks open the tree branch and reaches into the hole and grabs his prize, a bush baby for his lunch. The footage is shaky, but the intent is clear. This chimp is aiming to wound and kill with a weapon. Over the course of three years, Jill has watched spear hunting being passed from adult females to their adolescents, and now to the adult males. It's conceivable she's witnessed the very beginning of a new chimp technology led by the ladies of Fungoli. And as Jill's preparing to pack up and leave Fungoli until her next field season, the chimps will take on yet another scientific barrier between ape and human. On one of Jill's last treks after the chimps, she stumbles across one of the most amazing dramas in her nine years following the chimps here. It's Nickel hanging on to both a spear and her infant Teva. Teva wouldn't mind taking the spear as a plaything, but Mom has other ideas. Mother Nickel takes a couple of stabs at a hole where she has clearly already been hunting, leaving other spears behind. Then she abandons the spear in the hollow and allows little Teva to take her place. Teva
Shiva begins trying her hand at the spear in the tree. Eventually, she breaks it. And then, stunningly, Nickel makes her another tool and tries to hand it down. Teva doesn't take it. So Nickel reaches down and puts it in the hole for future lessons. And sure enough, little Teva is soon back at it, this time fashioning a spear of her own. Is Nickel actively teaching Teva how to hunt? Right now, they're on the razor's edge of chimp science. Humans are supposed to be the only ones who actively teach. Chimp babies are supposed to learn only through imitation. So why is it that the females are the more accomplished huntresses, the apparent technological innovators, and the best students? Perhaps they have no choice. Males in chimpanzee society grow up to dominate. Through sheer size and brute force, they monopolize the best of everything, especially food. So maybe this is driving the females to innovate, to get creative, especially in such a tough environment as Fungoli. All of this leads to the biggest question of all. What did the spear hunting females of Fungoli have to tell us about our own origins? Among our earliest ancestors, is it possible that females took the lead in technology? Innovating, fabricating, and mastering the tools of the kill. Well, it seems very likely, based on the chimpanzee data from Fungoli and elsewhere, that the female uh, Australopithecines would have been more persistent tool users, uh, perhaps more creative tool users, than the males. It does overturn the sort of mid-century um, ideas of the past that, uh, um, that tool use was just a male activity, the man the hunter idea. Instead it shows that, um, well, it might have been the female the huntress. And as the summer comes to an end, the community of Fongoli is thriving. Young, water-loving Frito is up to his old tricks. Mike, though, is now approaching the brink of adulthood and showing all the signs of wanting to be a big man. Tumbo, the star huntress of the savannah, has had her first baby, a little boy named Sai. And against all odds, little Amy is thriving after her kidnapping and rescue. She and her mother are inseparable. For all of the scientific breakthroughs that have occurred here, it is that rescue that will be the most seared into Jill's memory. I really don't think that, that anything that ever comes out of Bangali will be as satisfying to me as that, as that moment when we were able to, to bring that baby back to her mother. So for the year, that would be the, the high point for me, probably for, for my life. <laughs> as Jill's field season comes to an end, the chimps of Fungoli carry on breaking down barriers oblivious to their pioneering ways. Where will the chimps of Fungoli lead us next? Will they continue to take Jill to the precipice between ape and human? One thing is for sure. They have much left to tell Jill and leave us with many questions that we must ask ourselves. <laughs>